Hi folks, this is International Master Kostya Kavutsky, and today I'm going to be doing a video on the topic of rooks on semi-open files. So a semi-open file is a file where your rook has access to a lot of open squares and then is met with an enemy pawn. So it's not a fully open file, but it actually can, in a lot of cases, be even more useful for you since your rook has access to put pressure on your opponent's position. So I'll be showing you guys a couple of examples today, uh, demonstrating some key ideas, some thematic motifs when you do have your rook on a semi-open file and how we can use that to the best of your advantage. Our first example here, we have the great world champion Jose Capablanca playing white. And he really demonstrated this concept in a very, very pure form as he did for a number of ideas. Here he is playing white and black's last move was this move knight from f6 to e8, offering a, a trade of dark squared bishops. And here Capablanca plays a very nice idea in the move queen to h3. So he's threatening checkmate in one move on h7, and he's inducing some kind of weakness from black's king side. So black has a couple of options here. The first option is to play h6. Now, this might be met with just an immediate sacrifice of the bishop on h6, which would lead to white having a strong attack, or white could drop the bishop back and eventually use this pawn as a kind of target for white's pieces. So white here would most likely castle queenside, bring his rook to g1, and then push this pawn to g4 and g5, trying to open lines against black's king. So this move was not very advisable. The best move, in my opinion, was to move g6. This weakened some of black's dark squares, but I think this was, let's say, the best option that black had at their disposal right now. And if white plays bishop h6, then black can at least block with knight g7, and black is definitely worse here, but at least the king side is still defendable for now. I think white should again castle queen side and go for a king side attack, and white definitely has a better position. In the game, a third option was played, and that was the move f5. Now this f5 move is what we would say double-edged, uh, very, very double-edged. The benefit for black to playing f5 is that he immediately kind of shuts down white's bishop on this diagonal, and black will never have issues with the h7 pawn again. Black also takes control over the e4 square. So on a good day, black might dream about bringing his knight into the center with e4. The drawback, however, is that this f5 move leaves black's e6 pawn way behind and this pawn is now what we would call a backwards pawn meaning it cannot advance without being captured by an opponent's pawn and this pawn is now unprotected meaning no other black pawns can defend the pawn on e6 that makes this pawn a backwards pawn it's already on a semi-open file we're going to see white's rook come to e1 and put pressure on this pawn and this pawn becomes a huge strategic weakness so Capablanca recognizes this and immediately switches plans in order to start targeting this pawn. He trades bishops on e7 and castles kingside. Now white's advantage is that of a static nature. His structure is much better and he's going to use the semi-open e-file in order to put huge pressure onto e6. And I think he does this in really a masterful way. So rook f6 was played. Black understands he's going to have to defend this pawn long term. Rook fe1, knight d6, and rook e2. I mean, he really makes it look easy. He's simply doubling his rooks on the e-file. There is no other square these rooks would rather be on, and eventually is going to organize some kind of breakthrough against e6. Black's other problem, in addition to the weak pawn, is of course the light squared bishop is a very passive piece, and its sole purpose in this game is going to be to protect this weak pawn on e6 that needs constant support from black's pieces. All in all, uh, black here is basically what we would say is strategically lost. No real counterplay to speak of, white can build up endlessly and will eventually break through. So let's see how that happened. Bishop d7 was played, rook ae1, rook e8, and now white has organized all of his pieces to their most effective fashion. Now white needs to add some fuel to the fire in the form of a pawn advance. Note that the move g4 here, which some of you may have thought could be a good idea, 
is definitely a tricky move because we're taking advantage of the fact that our bishop is still on this diagonal. So black can't take the pawn. This would allow queen takes h7 check with some disastrous consequences. But this move is very double-edged itself because it also weakens white's king. So black would most likely ignore this advance, maybe play a move like g6, and it's not clear that this advance really achieved a whole lot for white. I think in general terms, if Capablanca can avoid weakening his own king, if he has another way of putting pressure on the position, he'd rather do that. So he comes up with the move c4. He wants to organize the breakthrough d4 to d5, and he's going to achieve that in just a couple of moves. Black played knight f7, and here we go. White is ready to play d5. Now black can take once on d5 with the c-pawns, but black can't afford to take with the e-pawn as this would open up his queen against white's two rooks, and white can find some kind of winning discovery here. For example, knight takes d7 is simply winning the game on the spot. The queen and the rook are both hanging on the e-file, and black is losing too much material. So, in the game, black exchanged knights on e5, rook takes e5, and g6 supporting the f5 pawn. Note that white was already threatening to capture on f5, taking advantage of the pin on e7. So g6 was played, queen h4 improving the queen, king g7, and queen d4. Now white is threatening all kinds of tactics along this diagonal here, specifically he just wants to take the e6 pawn. Black played c5, queen c3, b6, and here black is basically allowing white to capture the e6 pawn, which he did, with d takes e6. Now of course black cannot take on e6 in view of the fact that his rook is going to be pinned, so white will simply play rook takes e6, and black is losing material. He has to already give up his queen, and as long as white can avoid a back rank checkmate, he should be able to win this game very comfortably. After d takes e6, black just dropped back with the bishop, and now Capablanca finds a nice maneuver to improve his position even more. He plays the move bishop e2. His idea is to play bishop f3, bishop d5, support the e6 pawn, and then he'll be able to organize a breakthrough now that the pawn is fully secure and fully extra, of course. Here black blundered with the move bishop takes e6, but black already had a bad position and didn't realize the trouble he's getting himself into with this move. White plays bishop f3, king f7, and bishop d5. As you can see, black is totally pinned up on the e-file. The pressure that white has against the queen is simply too much. Queen d6 was played, and queen e3, simply relentless. Now the rook on e8 is also hanging, and black's bishop on e6 is just a sitting target for white's pieces. Black had no choice but to stay put with rook e7, and of course, white has no intention of simply exchanging all the pieces. Capablanca is going to keep the pin on the board, keep the pressure up, and now he's going to look for a second weakness to attack or to open a second front. So here we go. Queen h6, attacking the h7 pawn, king g8, and h4. Really just a fantastic move. Black cannot take the bishop on d5. His rook on e7 is still hanging. Black must sit and wait until white is able to break through and win the game. A6 was played, black has basically no other moves, h5, f4, takes on g6, takes on g6, and now the final move, rook takes e6. Very very simple tactical combination here, the point is that after black takes, white takes again on e6, black takes, and white uses this pin one more time along the diagonal to win the game with queen takes g6 check, and bishop takes e6. In view of all this, of course, black simply resigned after rook takes e6, seeing as how he's going to lose a piece by force. So I thought that was a very, very straightforward demonstration of what to do once you have this static advantage of having your rook lined up against your opponent's weakness. And it all started with this move queen to h3, inducing this f5 move, which gave black this terrible weakness on e6 that he wasn't able to protect. So with that, we'll now be moving on to our next example. So here we have another world champion, Alexander Alekhine, playing black, 
and he has already gotten a small advantage in this middle game in the form of having a superior pawn structure. If we take a look at the position, both sides have access to semi-open files. Here black, the obvious choice is to put his rook on c8 and put pressure on the c2 pawn. White's queen, however, is already putting pressure on e7. But the difference here is that black can easily support his pawn by advancing it to the e6 square where it'll be well protected, whereas white doesn't have such a simple solution for the pawn on c2. Because of this factor, I feel like black has a very clear advantage here, not to mention that I believe black's bishop here is actually going to have more potential in the position. Now white made kind of a drastic choice here in the move c4. I think this move is understandable because he didn't want to have to defend this pawn for the entire game, although ironically that is what ended up happening. A better choice would have been to play a move like b3 to develop the bishop, and after rook c8, rook f2, rook c7, black clearly stands better. He's going to double his rooks on the c file, in fact Alekhine might set up the famous Alekhine's gun by first doubling his rooks and then putting the queen behind them to basically triple up on the c2 pawn. Would this be enough to win the game? It's not clear, usually you need more than one weakness to target in order to be able to break through, but clearly we can say black's position would be preferable and his plan would be very straightforward. Just put as much pressure on that pawn as possible and then at some point look to switch flanks, maybe start up an attack on the king side with a move like h5, advancing h4, just to start bothering white's king a little bit. But that would be a completely different story. In the game, white played c4, he's trying to get rid of this weakness, and of course black captures on passant. After white recaptures, rook c8 was played, bishop b2, rook d8, white is more or less forced to push his other pawn to d4, rook f3, bishop f6, and finally d4. And so we've reached this position, which I think is clearly superior to black compared to the other position we looked at. Here, both of black's rooks have targets, but of course the c3 pawn is going to be a huge weakness that white will need to protect for the rest of the game. In chess terminology, we call these two pawns hanging pawns. And these can be double-edged. In some cases, if the hanging pawns can advance, for example c4, if this was possible, a lot of times the hanging pawns can be a strength because they really control a lot of squares and they offer some dynamic chances for white. But if the hanging pawns are blockaded, in this case they're going to be blockaded on the light squares, then there are a serious liability and black is going to have a dream position here putting pressure on these pawns. So let's see how that happened. In the game Alekhine played queen d5, I think this is a natural start, but actually a much better approach would have been to start with the move e7, e6. This is definitely a move black wants to play in the future, just taking control of all the light squares in the center. The reason that queen d5 is not so good is that here white had a chance to maybe drum up some counterplay with the move f5. After black takes this pawn, white can give a check on g3 and then play queen h3, and I think white might have some annoying pressure here. Uh, he's threatening to take the f5 pawn, and if black isn't careful, white might set up a very dangerous attack with queen h5 and rook to h3. Now the player playing white, George Thomas, did not find this opportunity, instead played queen e3 and basically remained passive for the rest of the game. Queen b5 was played, queen d2, rook d5, h3, finally we have e6, rook e1, and queen a4. When you have such a nice static advantage like this one, in this case, black's advantage is that his pieces are positionally very, very superior. You can really, really take your time. Black just wants to organize his pieces to their maximum, then you'll start pushing pawns and look for some kind of pawn break in order to break through in the position. Meanwhile, it's very unpleasant for white to have to sit and defend all of his weak pawns. In general, your pieces don't want to be defending your pawns. <laughs> Normally we want it to be the other way around, but here white's pieces are just going to be underused and going to be very, very passive. Nevertheless, let's see how black was able to break through. Here comes b5, fixing the pawn on c3, queen d1, and rook c4. So even though Alakhan was known as a very dynamic attacking player, he has no problem going into this endgame, 
He might even consider taking with the pawn here, but I think taking with the rook is more stable. Where he'll be able to grind and torture his opponent for 100 moves. Now that we have an endgame, black can even consider bringing in his king on the light squares, and this will put huge, huge pressure on white's position. We ended up getting an endgame similar to this actually in the game. White played queen b3. I think that's a very smart move, inviting black to trade queens, which would actually help white structure quite a bit. Now he gets to take control over the c4 square, he opens up his rook on the a file. This would be a dream come true for white. So of course black doesn't allow this, we're not exchanging on our opponent's terms. Rook d6 was played, king h2, and rook a6. Rook f1, bishop b7, king h1, rook c6, rook e1, bishop h4, rook f1, and queen c4. So both sides have just been kind of maneuvering around, white has to stay put, while black can try different ways of trying to break in through the position. Now at this point, white finally cracked and exchanged queens on c4. I think the reason is that he was concerned about black's queen infiltrating through e2, which would then be dangerous for white's king. If white tries a move like queen c2, for example, well, in addition to being able to take the a2 pawn, black also has the breakthrough b5, b4, based on the fact that the queen is unprotected, and that this would give black a winning pass pawn on c3. So this is not what white wants at all. So queen takes c4 was played, rook takes c4, white plays a3, he's tired of defending the a pawn with his rook, but of course this is another weakness that black can target and now he brings the bishop back immediately to put pressure on this pawn. Rook fb1 was played, quite a nice move. Now if black plays rook a4, he's not always starting to take on a3 because this would allow white to take and open up his rook against black's pawn on b5. So bishop d6 was played, g3, and now Alakine, as well as his opponent, both start to bring in their kings. But clearly it is black's king that is going to be more active here, reaching the nice d5 square. So king d3 was played, rook a5, bishop c1, and a6. So he's defending the pawn prophylactically, and now white's pieces have to stay glued to this pawn on a3, so otherwise they'll lose it, and with it the game. Bishop b2 was played, and here we go, maybe the most instructive moment of the game, h5. Black's pieces are set up perfectly. I mean, the bishop, the rook, and the king could not be placed better. It's time to create a second weakness. That is exactly what he's trying to do with the move h5. He's starting to play h4 and soften up white structure. White played h4, putting his last pawn on a dark square, making his dark sword bishop very sad indeed. And now Alakine has to organize the final breakthrough, and he does so with the move f6. The idea is to break open the position with e5, and once his bishop gets to use some more diagonals, all of white's pawns will end up being very weak. Bishop c1 was played, white has to stay put, e5, takes takes, and bishop b2. Of course, if white takes on e5 a second time, black can take with the bishop, and now g3 is hanging, and this rook can swing over to g4. This is one of the huge advantages of having a space advantage, is that when you have more space in the position, your pieces have much more freedom to swing from side to side, and so black here is just completely winning. In the game, bishop b2 was played, black took on d4, c takes d4, and finally we get the breakthrough with b4. Now white took on b4, which is essentially giving up the game. A better defense would have been to go for some activity with a move like rook f1, but here black is winning after finding this nice maneuver. King c6, rook comes down to f6, and rook f5. A really nice idea. Well, if white exchanges rooks, then after we take, we're going to be winning the pawn on a3, and that's going to be tremendous for black. But the bigger point is that if white takes on g6, Black comes down to the second rank, and White's bishop ends up being in huge trouble. Next is b takes a3 again, and Black is winning material and with it the game. So that would have been a better try, but still a basically a hopeless position for White. In the game he took on b4, Black captured on a2, White took the rook on a5, and of course Black took the free bishop on b2, and White resigned. So a really masterful demonstration here by Alakine. He got the static advantage of playing against the hanging pawns. He put his rooks, his queen, and his bishop on the perfect squares, 
and once he got the queen exchange, he brought his king in, organized the final breakthrough, and was able to convert pretty flawlessly. I hope you guys learned from the two games today, and try to take notice, you know, when you do get the static advantage of having your rook on a semi-open file targeting this weakness, try to figure out what's the best way to put pressure on it, and when the time is right, look for that second weakness that you can break, or look for some chances on the other side of the board so that you can really maximize the effectiveness of your pieces. With that, that wraps up our lesson for today. This has been International Master Kostya Kavutsky, signing off.